Inside Albany is made possible by the public television stations of New York and the New York Network. Additional support provided by the Energy Association of New York State. Made up of New York State's seven investor-owned electric companies. Providing energy and jobs for a growing New York. An Inside Albany special. Coverage of the Democratic State Convention from Albany. of Mario M. Cuomo. God bless you. God bless you. We're going to be reminding New Yorkers of how we've turned the poetry of our promises into the solid brick and mortar of our governance. And I can't wait. I'm telling you. A governor who has made the state of New York Truly and magnificently, the family of New York. Al D'Amato and Mark Green couldn't be more different. For the 1970s, while I was trying to shake government up, we know he was trying to shake it down. But I am prepared to do it. I have the strength to do it. I have the resources to do it. And behind you all, behind me, and the rest of the Democrats in this state, by God, we're going to do it. The Democrats said they were going to hold a convention here this week in Albany, but it wound up to be more of a celebration. Some said a coronation. Mario Cuomo was crowned king, and although he handpicked his court, he left some room for some traditional Democratic fighting over who should run for the U.S. Senate. We'll get to that story, introduce you to Cuomo's running mate, and have a lively conversation with a group of reporters a little later. First, to the star of the Democrat show, their governor. Four years ago, he was the outsider. June 1982, New York City Mayor Ed Koch picks a ticket and dominates a convention. Standing alone, rejected by 61% of the Democratic delegates, but still on the ballot, then Lieutenant Governor Mario Cuomo began his campaign for governor. This week in Albany, he wasn't alone anymore. Four years in politics is a lifetime. This week, Mario Cuomo, who many Democrats dubbed as a loser who had never won an office on his own by 1982, was the man the Democrats couldn't get close enough to. Mario Cuomo remembered other times. It is uh, wonderful to be here, to see even quickly on the way in so many faces from uh, years gone by. I saw Arnie Brown on the way in and remembered uh, 10 or 11 years ago trying to put three people together, four people together at a table in a diner before I had to go over and face the Reform Caucus of Nassau County. The Reform Caucus and the NDC, I remember 1974, going to the NDC, where I made a brilliant, brilliant speech. Got a standing ovation and zero votes from the NDC. It was the first time in the history of the new Democratic co coalition that even their vast compassion did not find room for a single grubby vote for a candidate. It's a long time ago, and uh, a lot has happened since then, and Matilda and I and the whole family are grateful for every bit of it. And Cuomo and wants to make sure it continues, so he gave a breakfast for delegates Monday morning and told them a story. Dippy O'Neill ran for Congress. When it was all over, he was talking to a woman who lived next door, who had known him since he was a kid. He was talking about the election. She said, he said, well, you know, I'm glad you voted. She said, I didn't vote for you. He says, you didn't vote for me. You've known me all my life. Why didn't you vote for me? She said, you never asked me. <laughs> I'm asking you, vote for Mario Cuomo for governor. Easy to joke now, but in 1982, Cuomo worried about keeping all the votes pledged to him at the convention. Back then, his son and chief political tactician, Andrew Cuomo, remembered the roll call and his mother Matilda's reaction. Yesterday on the floor, the roll call, and I was, my mother seated in the mezzanine with the family and we had come through the roll call started in Suffolk the first AD in Suffolk we had come all the way all the way through Suffolk and Cuomo had not received one vote and I was walking up the aisle and I looked up and I saw my mother's face on the mezzanine and if looks could kill Dave 
the expression was one like, if we don't get a vote soon, don't come home. This Monday morning, Matilda Cuomo looked back at that time. Even though he was worried about that, it's true. He was very comfortable that he should get it because he was very much at ease with the fact that he was ready to be governor. I was too. When I campaigned for him, I did it with all my heart and soul. Because I, when you know as a teacher, when you have your lesson plan and everything set pedagogically, you know what you're doing out there. And, and the, you, the fact that you're telling people what you really believe is true and right and right for them. That makes it so easy because I had never campaigned to the extent I did in that campaign. And I felt so good about it. this time around. It's even more a sense of ease, a sense of real comfort in knowing that he's worked so hard. And I think the people realize that. I mean, you just have to know that things are better, far better, and this man has given 110 percent. How are you coping with uh, your husband being uh, on the cover of Time magazine? Is he getting a big head? Well, I don't think that caricature would give anybody a big head. <laughs> it was a terrible caricature, but, but those things happen. How are you coping with that? What, is, what does that mean to the family as you sit around the breakfast table? Here's, here's your husband on the cover of Time magazine. Well, he was on Newsweek, too. Yeah. No, I tell you, Christopher still, they play basketball together, and Mario wants to give him a hip movement, he will, and Christopher tries to win the game from his dad. It's the same thing. I mean, truly, I think my, my children, we've been blessed with them, wonderful children, and they're very flexible. He's dad. I mean, there's none of that. Uh, none of that doesn't all. matter if I he's at a national stands. magazine? No, not at all. He's still dead. And Christopher has to be told to study harder for his final test coming up. Could be the Cuomo so, uh, creed. Study harder, do better, okay. even when you're on top. Make sure you vote for me today. <laughs> no, hey. Forget about it. You know, I come from a depression background. We don't take anything for granted. So how will the governor approach this campaign and deal with Andrew O'Rourke, his Republican opponent? First, it seems, he won't even mention his name. And second, he won't respond to his attacks directly. It's called taking the high road. I don't want to get involved in name calling. I don't want to get involved in anything that's negative. You know, you don't build bridges by carping and criticizing. I want to conduct this campaign the way we've conducted progress in the state for 50 and 100 years, by building, by being affirmative, by being constructive. You don't get anywhere by tearing things down. You know, any, any fool can tear something down. One of Cuomo's political operatives, Meyer Sandy Frusher, was around to talk about campaign strategy. You're smiling and happy this morning. A little different from four years ago, right? Yeah, it's a great day. It's nice to be an incumbent. It's nice to have a record. It's nice to run on uh, a record of achievement, and that's what the governor's going to do. I've heard him say uh, out here when somebody asked him about O'Rourke, oh, let's not talk about them now, and he's been doing that. Is the strategy just to ignore O'Rourke for a while as far as the governor is concerned? Maybe other people will talk about O'Rourke, uh, but not the governor. No, I think the governor's going to run on his record. I think that's the way he should run. O'Rourke is going to run against the record. O'Rourke is not a, uh, uh, an entity in this campaign. O'Rourke is attacking the governor and attacking the governor's record. The governor says, I have a good record, and I'm going to present my record to the people, and I think that's what he's going to do for this campaign. He's going to run on the record, and he's going to run on his aspirations and dreams for the future. So not respond to any O'Rourke uh, attacks at this point? I think he's just going to go out there and make his case to the people, and I think that'll be the best way to approach this campaign. But the appearance of a story Monday morning about O'Rourke's involvement in a land deal with people with apparent organized crime connections suggested somebody in the Cuomo camp might be taking the low road. No, I don't think it has anything to do with the campaign. Maurice Inchi has been investigating the Alturi landfill for two years. You don't think it has anything to do with the campaign? Is the timing rather curious? No, no. At the timing of the, the Alturi landfill was something that... Uh, uh, Mr. O'Rourke chose to purchase at this particular point in time, and Maurice Inchi responded by saying that it's been a known toxic landfill for four, for uh, many years, since 1979. So I don't think that has anything to do with the campaign. That has to do with Mr. O'Rourke's record and Mr. O'Rourke's governance, which I think should be looked at as part of the campaign. But as far as the governor is concerned, as far as we're concerned, we're going to run on the governor's record. We're going to run on the progress that the state has been making. On the other hand, Fruscher portrayed the Republican campaign as anything but positive. I think the Republican strategy is somewhat unfortunate. I think it's uh, negativism. I think it's bashing New York. I think it's denigrating. Uh, uh, I think Mr. O'Rourke has made it clear that his only campaign is going to try to be uh, to use uh, innuendo and death. And, uh, and I don't think that that elevates the process. It's Positive versus negative. That's the way the Cuomo forces want reporters to see the upcoming campaign. They also wanted their convention to be seen as a model of unity, as opposed to the Republican affair last week. So who nominated Mario Cuomo? The Democratic leader who was known to have been frequently at odds with the governor over spending and policy.
Outgoing Assembly Speaker Stanley Fink put all that aside Monday. It has been my privilege to serve my colleagues in the Assembly as Speaker during Mario Cuomo's tenure in office. I have worked with him, sat in meetings, shared the private thoughts, the accomplishments and frustrations of the past four years. I tell you from personal observation that these years have brought a depth of conscience and competence to the governor's chair of which we can all be proud. Seconding Cuomo's nomination was Dominic Baranello, the former party chairman from Suffolk County, who had been at Ed Koch's side in 1982. In effect, Cuomo was showing the political world he was in total command. Baranello became another cheerleader. When I say one, two, three, I want you to say, I second the nomination of Mario Cuomo, but I want you to do it loud because I want him to hear it. The ears of America are on us today. I want you to hear it. One, I want you to say it loud. Two, I want your county to hear that. Three, I second the nomination of Mario M. Cuomo. God bless you. God bless you. If there's a motion, is there a second? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. aye. That nomination is carried unanimously. So within an hour and a half of convening, the Democrats, by acclamation, made Governor Mario Cuomo their official candidate for re-election. The old ball player was already swinging for the fences. Three full minutes of cheers were heard before the candidate could speak. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would never, never try to follow somebody like Dominic Baranello, so we'll save, our, we'll save our speech for tomorrow. I simply want to say for Matilda and for all the Cuomos, we are terribly, terribly grateful for your vote of confidence. We're especially grateful to our good friends, Denny and Louise and Dominic, and the great, great speaker of the Assembly of the State of New York, Stanley Fink. We'll see you tomorrow. We won't let you down. Thank you, and God bless you. Cuomo might have said you ain't seen nothing yet to prepare the delegates for the rally that was to come on Tuesday when he returned to the hall to deliver his acceptance speech. But first, there were other things on his agenda. Number one on the list after his own designation was to transform a little-known southern-tier congressman into a winning lieutenant governor candidate. And that project started Monday morning. His reputation for excellence, for commitment, for being able to achieve things has grown so that all the people involved with government in this state many of them involved with government in this nation know what an extraordinary individual he is and what a great contribution he makes to our public and political life. Governor Cuomo seemed to be working hard to pump up Stanley Lundeen, his hand-picked choice as a running mate. Cuomo's lieutenants were also hard at work. I think Stan Lundeen was a great choice. First and foremost, I think it demonstrates the commitment of the governor to extend the notion of family. Uh, Stan Lundeen represents a part of the state that has not traditionally been represented. Uh, the Democratic Party is reaching out to all parts of the state. Mr. Lundeen's district runs 150 miles across the state. He's well known from Binghamton to the western frontier of the state. He has a superior record in Congress. He has a magnificent record as a, uh, as a mayor. He's somebody who could serve as a governor, and I think it was an inspired choice by the governor. Those familiar with Lundeen describe him politically as a cautious moderate who believed in quiet consensus building as mayor of Jamestown and as a Democratic winner for the last 10 years in the Republican southern tier. Lundeen is being observed closely because if Cuomo should leave office to run for president, Lundeen would become governor. Cuomo dealt with that eventuality Monday morning. And what I was looking for was somebody who was competent to be governor immediately, not because I have some, you know, hidden agenda for running for higher office later on. I'm so tired of addressing that question, I'm not going to bore you with it. But forget about that. Let's, if they had a new rule that said former baseball players from Queens aren't eligible for the presidency, I'd still be looking for a lieutenant governor who was competent to be governor immediately. And that's what we did. As the governor was doing his best to beat the drums for Lundeen, over at the convention center, the first mild notes of discord were being heard. Minority delegates had reservations about this relative unknown. As a rural upstater, would he be sympathetic to New York City interests? Congressman Robert Garcia tried to answer that concern as he nominated Lundeen. Having spent so many years in a state legislature myself, I can tell you that there are sometimes problems between city and upstate. But Stan Lundeen, in every occasion, when the city of New York needed help 
Stan Lundin was there. But blacks were concerned Lundin might not be there for them. Cuomo's response, bring on Assemblywoman Barbara Patton at the last moment to second Lundin's nomination. I placed in nomination a third seconder, actually, for Stan Lundin, uh, primarily because I was asked to by the governor's office. Even as Lundin's name was being proposed, other disappointed blacks were meeting behind closed doors to consider what action they should take to protest. After the meeting, Assemblyman Arthur Eves spoke to reporters. I had problems with Mr. Lundin, who supported Graham Rudman. I mean, Graham Rudman is the most deadly piece of legislation that has been passed in Congress that will diminish the quality of life of, of, of urban populations and poor people and working poor that I've ever seen. Lundin's man said the congressman's vote was for a balanced budget. Barbara Patton said she understood Arthur Eve and other blacks' protests. Well, I certainly um, have not been here as long as those two uh, colleagues of mine. I do respect their uh, opinion. I also, however, respect a governor that I think has served this com my community and my constituency and the people of the state very well. I think that uh, while many of us don't know Stan Lundin, that in fact he is the governor's choice. And I might add that one of the disappointments I had is that we as a community, we as a black community, did not, I think, press for as much as we could have as a, a, an alternative uh, to Stan Lundin. So this uh, is a little late, do you think, what they're doing? That today is a little late, certainly. You know, the convention is here, the governor has made his choice. And that was the bottom line for delegates as they fell into place with the governor's wishes. According to party chairman Lawrence Kerwin, Lundin got 95 percent of the votes. New York City businessman Gilbert De Lucia, 5 percent. But there still could be a primary. Another millionaire businessman, Abraham Hirschfeld, promises to petition to get on the ballot. He already has bought TV commercials. He could embarrass the governor if he pulled an upset. I want you to help us to help Stan to win in that primary. And he may need a lot of help because there may be other candidates. And some of them may have money. And they may buy television. And television is a very tough thing to deal with. Another possible Lundin primary opponent popped up at the convention. Bronx Assemblyman John Deary says he has support statewide. Initially, a group of Irish American leaders, a thousand or more around the state, had advanced my name to the governor and urged that I give some consideration to it. That was approximately two weeks ago. And subsequent to that, and as a result of it, it triggered some statements of support from other groups that I've been involved with. I've been the chairman of the Committee on Cities and traveled in and out of every 62 cities in this state for the last 10 years. Um, I've been very much involved in the tenants movement. I've been the longest serving member of the Committee on Aging in the Assembly. These are all groups and coalitions around the state that I've worked with. Labor is another one, and many of them have urged me to seriously consider this race. The bottom line is this. I, I really believe that with a Congressman Lundin, a Mr. Hirschfeld, and a Mr. De Lucia, that this race for Lieutenant Governor, the second most important position in the state, cries out for another candidate to, to be in that field. The field, according to Deary, has no one who has shown leadership on statewide issues. The political risk is that Deary must give up the seat he's held for 13 years in the Assembly and run against the governor's personal choice. You're going to get him. You're going to work for him. You're going to make him lieutenant governor of the great state of New York. Lundin would have had to have been Lincoln to survive the buildup he received, and the anointed lieutenant governor candidate was not Lincoln. Government must be supportive rather than intrusive. Government must be responsive rather than oppressive. That's Governor Cuomo's concept of government. That's my concept of government. And that's the traditional concept of the Democratic Party. I am proud to form a partnership with a governor who in his first term has led us from economic distress through recovery to the threshold of economic resurgence. A governor who has made the state of New York truly and magnificently the family of New York. The applause lines came whenever Lundin mentioned his benefactor's name. There wasn't any when he tried to deal with black leaders' discontent. I was a student in the South at the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. I saw the deprivation and hopelessness that was forced on some people by a system of American apartheid. I joined in the very first lunch counter demonstrations and picketing. 
I worked for John F. Kennedy and other com candidates committed to opening opportunities for all Americans. We made a difference. Today, government must continue to work to ensure that opportunities remain open. Later that in an interview, Lundin said he was aware of the complaints from yeah. some minorities. I'm going to be reaching out to blacks. I think I have a record that is worthy of their support. I want to work with them because if there's anything I believe in, it's the cause of civil rights and equal opportunity. And uh, I think that uh, we can work together. I respect their problems. I understand where they come from. I think they should understand where I come from and my constituency and all. Uh, but I do intend to have meetings, and that's a very high priority. I asked Lundin how the lieutenant governor offer came. He said he first met with the governor a little over three weeks ago in New York City. Well, going in, I didn't know that I'd accept it. Uh, Sarah and I talked it over. and Sarah, decided, your wife. Your wife, yes, Sarah. Yep. Wife, and I decided I would ask for 24 hours to think about it if he, if he did offer it. And as it turned out, he wasn't prepared to make an offer either. He said I was the first that he had interviewed and he would be interviewing others. He talked for about 30, 35 minutes, I would guess, about the office. He went on and on and told me everything that he could think of to tell me about the office and wanted to get that out on the table first. And then we talked about everything that you could imagine that two people would talk about the lieutenant governor's office in that circumstance. Of course, most people are looking at this choice as very important, as you're aware, because of the governor's future uh, possibility that he might want run for president. How did that come up in the conversation? Did you bring it up? Did he bring he it up? He brought it up. Uh, he said that, of course, there's this speculation, Stan. I have no plans. I have no secret program to run for president. And I said, well, I wasn't planning to ask you whether you were or not. I just want to say one thing about it. I would like to be the kind of a lieutenant governor that whose advice you would seek before you made a definite decision on running for president, if you should ever come to that point. And he smiled and said that I might not be the most unbiased observer in that situation, but we kidded about that. And he said, that's exactly the kind of lieutenant governor I want. Recent governor, Even lieutenant governor relations, Kerry Krupsack, Kerry Cuomo, and Cuomo Del Bello, have been rocky to say the least. Lundin said that was because they were shotgun marriages. We're starting out where Governor Cuomo doesn't need me to get reelected, quite frankly, I don't believe. And I didn't need the job. I was very happy being a congressman and had no uh, particular need or desire to seek another office. So why did he take the gamble? I thought it'd be a more exciting job and that I could make a better contribution. That's the first reason. The second is political. I'm not a wealthy person. I'm of very modest means. I'm from a remote corner of the state. When somebody offers you a political opportunity to have a statewide chance in politics, you know that that's a ring that'll probably come by only once in your lifetime, and you have to seriously consider it. We'll talk about Lundin's grant for the gold ring a little later in this hour with a group of reporters. Just a footnote to the lieutenant governor's story, Assemblyman John Deary announced on Friday that he would not seek the lieutenant governor nomination. He cited family considerations as his reason. Well, this convention didn't act like the traditional Democratic free-for-all, except for when it came to picking one spot on the slate. Who would be the best Democrat to oppose U.S. Senator Al D'Amato? A man who in January sits down with Jesse Helms and in June tries to be the Democratic nominee for Senate, I think is a political chameleon. But the, uh, the point is, Mark Green has never served a day in a political uh, party office. I have for 20 years, and he hasn't served a day in the government of any government, federal, state, local. Uh, and he's not in any position to be the moral arbiter of the Democratic Party or anything else. John Dyson has a ton of money, a sharp tongue, and a government pedigree as a carry cabinet officer and chairman of the State Power Authority. Mark Green is a public interest lawyer, an author, and a longtime associate of consumer activist Ralph Nader. Governor Cuomo encouraged Dyson to abandon a rumored run for controller to seek the Senate seat. But Cuomo claims he will stay out of the contest. Green takes him at his word. The governor has said that he is neutral. I absolutely take him at his word. 
and I will win or lose the nomination uh, on my own, as I always expected from the beginning. But when Cuomo was asked about Green's portrayal of Dyson as a closet conservative, the governor reacted this way. What I would uh, be concerned about in John Dyson's case is how he's governed. He was Ag and Markets Commissioner. He was Commerce Commissioner. Power Authority Chairperson. You can make all the speeches you want. What did he do when he was governing? If you show me some things that John Dyson did that are outrageously conservative, then you've got a case. Uh, I would prefer that the concentration in the Senate race be on the Republican and not on the Democrats. Cuomo has said he encouraged Dyson because his personal wealth could approach D'Amato's war chest. Dyson says he'll spend $3 million out of his own bank account. Green, who has raised a few hundred thousand, is undaunted. We are the party of Cuomo, not Learman. I'm going to win this nomination and see, not buy it, because among Democrats, message beats money. And my message as a real fighting Democrat in my 16-year public interest career, I think will overwhelm John Dyson's documented record a flirtation with the conservative cause. Green's charges were familiar ones, according to former state Democratic chairman Joseph Krangel. It's sort of interesting how history repeats itself. I remember very well in 1976 when I nominated Pat Moynihan. There were those Democrats who were saying the same thing about Pat Moynihan. He served in the Nixon cabinet, uh, in the White House, rather. And those people saying he's not a real Democrat. Well, the fact of the matter is no one has a monopoly on the definition of what a real Democrat is. And those of us from upstate New York I like to think ourselves as unhyphenated Democrats. Uh, we're centrist, we're plain and simple. There's no prefix before our political uh, name of Democrat. And I think John Dyson personifies those great traditions of our Democratic Party. A Green supporter, Assemblyman Mark Siegel, also remembers the past when asked about Green's chances in November if he wins the primary. Many believe Senator D'Amato would rather run against Green than Dyson. Well, just think back to how D'Amato won the nomination himself. He was the activist outsider. He was the person of whom they said he couldn't win in November if he won the Republican nomination. He ran the less well-financed campaign in the primary. Now, that's one of the perfect examples of how someone who comes from the throbbing heart of the party can turn people on and win. And then because something exciting and unexpected has happened, because he's someone who offers a strong, differentiated choice, he can go on and win in November. But the Green candidacy took another body blow last weekend. The Liberal Party endorsed Dyson. Didn't that undercut Green's charges? Uh, not at all, because it is neither Liberal nor a party. Jim Notaro, sitting alone in a room trying to save his dying party, has no relevance at all to a race for Senate or the mantle of liberalism. I'm delighted to say that authentic liberal leaders and institutions have nearly unanimously supported my candidacy. So the stage was set for the nominations. Party regulars were with Dyson, insurgents were Green. The suspense of the roll call was centered on how well Green would do, not on whether Dyson would be the official designee of the party. As it turned out, Green's people were happy with their almost 35 percent of the delegates' votes. Green entered to the music of If I Were a Rich Man and continued that theme. What does it take to run for the United States Senate? What does it take to win something as special as the votes, the trust of your fellow citizens? It takes more than money, more than commercials, more than slogans. You and I know that you don't win such a campaign without passion, integrity, and commitment. I may not have been in the power authority, but I'm an authority on power. After those shots at Dyson, Green turned his fire on D'Amato. He incessantly implies that he's saving the damsel in distress, except it was he who tied her to the tracks in the first place. Well, I won't let him get away with the hypocrisy of cutting ribbons and photo opportunities in New York. Well, back in Washington, he's cutting programs to ribbons that New York needs. <clears throat> Al D'Amato and Mark Green couldn't be more different. For the 1970s, while I was trying to shake government up, we know he was trying to shake it down. Dyson, whose theme was I Love New York, from the tourist campaign he began as Commerce Commissioner, completely ignored Green during his acceptance speech. Al D'Amato was his target. You and I are going to tell the truth to the people of this state about Al D'Amato and we are going to beat him because of it. We're going to tell him 
about his bad votes, and every time he makes a phony claim about how he brought money to New York, we're going to expose it and we're going to answer it. And every time he has a commercial, I'm going to have one too. Now, you and I know that this campaign is not going to be easy. He is an entrenched incumbent, so he thinks. He has a lot of money from all the wrong places. But I am prepared to do it. I have the strength to do it. I have the resources to do it. And behind you all behind me and the rest of the Democrats in this state, by God, we're going to do it. But first, there will be a primary. I asked Dyson if Green's 35% showing meant he, as the front runner, was vulnerable. He's been doing it for nine months. And I beat him 65 to 35, and that's a, that's a sounding two-to-one drubbing for someone who's been running around for nine months, and it shows that having a record in the government will matter to the voters in September, and it will matter to them in November, too. Dyson says he's going to stop answering Green's charges. I gave him one more shot. You say he doesn't have any documentation. He's quoting newspaper articles from uh, events. Were you the co-chairman of a uh, conservative party dinner, dinner along with Jesse Helms, in honor of George Bush. Did that happen? No, He's got the program. He's no, it not, only, it, not, it not only didn't happen uh, because it was uh, incorrectly uh, printed, but the point is even, even when I announced they had a picture of my supposed son Nicholas in the New York Times, his paper as important as New York Times, said I had a son Nicholas. Now, I have two wonderful daughters, but I happen to, don't have a son Nicholas. That was a friend of mine. And mistakes are made in newspapers and in printed programs, too. What we need to do is focus on the Democratic Party on Al D'Amato, and I'm not going to engage in answering or, or starting uh, these kinds of uh, debates among Democrats. But that's what he's going to come at you with, because generally uh, popular wisdom is that liberals win Democratic primaries. Well, I was endorsed by the Liberal Party, and I think uh, that puts the end of that argument. He said the Liberal Party is politically irrelevant. It's Jim Notaro and a couple of his friends sitting in a room. The uh, last two guys that had their nomination running statewide in primaries were named Mario Cuomo and Hugh Carey. Dyson says Green is a far-left throwback to the 60s without a record in government. Green's response? Isn't this a familiar conversation? 1982, Mario Cuomo was told by party leaders he was too liberal, and he didn't have enough money, and he shouldn't run. Well, he had a rationale. He took his case to the Democratic voters, and he won, even though he wasn't the insider candidate. Dyson has just told me that this is probably the last time, uh, if he can help it, that he will uh, talk about your charges of him being conservative and, and so forth. That he's going to try to basically run against Al D'Amato and talk about what he would do against D'Amato. Um, how are you going to deal with that? Well, I'm going to base my campaign on my contrast with Al D'Amato. A Mark Green Al D'Amato race will provide the clearest choice in a generation. But the stuff that you put out today was all anti-Dyson. Uh, I'm told yesterday on an ABC program in New York that when you were asked about some what some of the governor's uh, people had said, you said, I don't deal with the monkeys, I'll deal with the organ grinder. And that really lost you some people here, and that alienated a lot of people that you, it seems like you're calling uh, the governor an organ grinder. No, let me tell you, that the whole point there was when I was asked, isn't the governor really for Dyson? And I said, you are wrong. The governor has told me that he is neutral, and I believe my governor. Why don't you believe my governor? But did you I say said, that? I mean, that is it, did oh, you it say a, that on, on television? Oh, it was a metaphor for making the point of believing and listening to the head person, not the second banana. Do you it was regret an innocent, what you said? Do you think that that was an inappropriate way to phrase it? Was it was an innocent metaphor whose point was valid. Now, you asked me a question about the basis of my campaign. I spent 16 years as an issues Democrat. I have sent a deluge of material to the delegates here about what's wrong with Al D'Amato's record. And I'm going to continue to do that. Let me tell you, I want to provide a choice to the Democratic voters also. And if we're seeking the Democratic nomination, and I'm running against a man who this January attended a conservative party dinner and gave money to the conservative party at a dinner he co-hosted with Jesse Helms and Henry Kissinger, you bet I'm going to be talking about whether the public should vote for conservative John Dyson in January, who says he's liberal John Dyson in June. What will he be in November? While the Green-Dyson match sparked some controversy and a little news, the other nominations that filled out the top of the ticket went by without much of a ripple. Attorney General Robert Abrams, running for a third term, called for a radical overhaul of the way politics interacts with government. One proposal to remove political leaders from elective office caused the Brooklyn delegation to boycott his speech. 
Afterward, I asked him about his opponent, Peter King's charge, that Abrams should have been more active before the New York City corruption scandal broke. Well, the fact of the matter is that we are involved on crucial aspects of this scandal. It was the Attorney General's office, together with Bob Morgenthau's office, the DA of New York County, that presented the information to the grand jury that wound up in the indictment of the Bronx County chairman and the major officials of City Source Corporation that built the city in a $22 million contract. The fact of the matter is that it's our office investigating with the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District, a sitting state senator, for possible conflict of interest. We're cooperating with the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District with respect to possible kickbacks in the surrogates court um, over in Queens. I'm working with the state controller, dealing with possible issues of corruption uh, with respect to public administrators. And the fact of the matter is that no attorney general in history has ever done more with respect to criminal enforcement than myself, knowing that the office of attorney general is essentially a civil office. Abrams is regarded as the favorite in his race. The Democrats' candidate for controller is seen as a long shot. Herman Badillo is an attorney, a certified public accountant, a former congressman, and a former deputy mayor of New York City. He promises to be an activist controller. He calls the incumbent, Edward Regan, a passive bookkeeper. Badillo is especially critical of Regan's refusal to take New York pension funds out of companies which do business with South Africa. The controller has a fiduciary responsibility, but he has a moral responsibility as well. Uh, you don't invest in slavery, for example, though it might be cheaper. You don't invest in apartheid because that is an evil that we want to eradicate. You don't invest in people who discriminate against a religious group in Northern Ireland. And to say that you have to do it because you make more money shows a lack of vision, a lack of imagination. You don't have to invest in IBM as against a little computer company. You can take the money that is now in IBM which does business with South Africa, and put it in another Fortune 500 company. Barron's financial uh, report uh, recently showed that the 125 companies not doing business with South Africa had a better long-term record than the 375 that were doing business in South Africa. So if I'm a clerk so, and I'm living on a pension in the state of New York, and I, I, I don't I have to be worried, though? I mean, IBM no. and GM and those companies do very well you don't for me if I'm a clerk. You don't have to be worried because your money will be protected, but at the same time, you don't have to be worried that your money is being used to contribute to evil activities in South Africa or in Northern Ireland. The Badillo Abrams nominations took a back seat, as did everything else, to the climax of the convention, Mario Cuomo's acceptance speech. It took place just after noon on Tuesday in the same room where he had been inaugurated. That day he gave a speech that moved some of his audience to tears and began to build his reputation as an orator. That day also the music came from a recording by Neil Diamond. It was a song about immigrants coming to America. This week in Albany, that same throbbing beat was heard again, but in an entirely new context. It filled the room with energy and memorable spectacle. In 1982, Mario Cuomo was alone at the podium, but this time he was triumphant, a national figure, a winner, a possible presidential contender. That was a fact Neil Diamond's song wouldn't let anyone forget. The crowd was swept up in the emotion of the rally. When the song died, the chanting began. Finally, when the lights dimmed and quiet descended, a lone voice in the back of the chamber called out, Play ball, Mario. We play ball only with Democrats. But before launching into a recitation of the highlights of his record for the Democrats, Cuomo took a look back. You know, four years ago, in 1982, almost to the day, I made the following entry in my diary, and I'd like to read it to you. It said, Papa came in 1926 without a penny. Half a century later, the family that he and Mama started here are enjoying the milk and honey of the greatest and most abundantly blessed nation in the world. Just the idea, I wrote, that I'm considered a possible choice for governor is a dramatic illustration of what this country means. 
It's the definition of the word opportunity. I finished the day yesterday wondering if I will ever be able to repay the enormous kindness I have received. I wrote those words on June 6, 1982. Cuomo said one of his few 1982 promises was to work very hard. He said he had fulfilled that promise. Then he recited his record. At the top, the largest tax cut in the history of the state. That tax cut is going to save taxpayers in this state more than $3 billion over three years. And the reform removes 500,000 New Yorkers, think of it, 500,000 New Yorkers who are living below the poverty line, removes them from the tax rolls. And we cut the tax rates to their lowest point in 27 years, back to the time before the Republicans got their hands on them. The governor never said that Republicans claim credit for pushing him to cut taxes, nor did he mention his Republican opponent, Andrew O'Rourke, by name. He did say that since he became governor, almost 900,000 more people are working and that the state's highways and bridges were being rebuilt. It was all part of what he called the New York idea. We have proved that New York means business. But we proved much more than that. We proved that the New York idea works that we can balance our books, that we can practice fiscal prudence without ignoring the reasonable needs of our hardworking middle class and of our struggling poor. We have proven that today government can have a heart and a head, that common sense and compassion can go hand in hand. And our principal point, we've made it over and over, that we are at our very best as a people when we recognize one basic truth, that we are all, all of us, connected one to another, that no man is an island, no woman, no neighborhood, no village, no county, no nation. And because of that, because we depend on one another, because we need one another, because we touch one another, we should work together and hope together for the good of all of us. That's the New York idea. I tell you, you can see that we're going to have fun for five months this summer because it goes on and on. I could go on with the list of achievements and believe me, in the five months ahead of us, I'm going to. We're going to go everywhere delivering the good news of this record. We're going to be heard from St. Lawrence to Suffolk. We're going to be heard from Clinton to Queens. We're going to be heard from Franklin County to Franklin Square. We're going to be heard from Chautauqua to Staten Island. We're going to be reminding you, all right, so I left a few places out. We're going to be reminding New Yorkers of how we turned the poetry of our promises into the solid brick and mortar of our governance. And I can't wait, I'm telling you. In the rest of the speech, there were a couple of out-and-out -out promises. Upstaters will keep their hydropower, and the Shoreham nuclear power forward. plant must not open. The then Cuomo told the crowd of his optimistic the vision of the future. Fiber optic throughways, genetically the engineered odds, vaccines, and manufacturing industries growing, the not shrinking in New York. It would come because New Yorkers, he said, were the, the product House, of generations who were told it couldn't be done and who did it. We are the children of those giants. We're the heirs to the legacy of courage and concern and achievement which they left us. And because we are their heirs, we will ignore the faint-hearted. We will ignore the naysayers who neither build nor dream. And instead, we will remember who we are. We will remember where we came from. We will remember how much we've done. And then we will go from this place to lead the way to doing the rest. All of us, the whole family of New York, together. Let's go do it. Excelsior. God bless you. The frenzy started again as soon as Cuomo ended. It was only quieted when the house lights were doused for a surprise laser light show, apparently designed to pick up Cuomo's theme of seeing a bright future for New York. To the theme song of Star Wars, Cuomo's name and new slogan suddenly appeared suspended in midair above the crowd. Away from the crush that followed as the candidate moved through the hall, we talked to a volunteer from 1982 who recalled that lasers weren't exactly in their convention budget at that point. 
The most, most interesting uh, story of the uh, 1982 convention was uh, in our walkie-talkies from the camper outside to the backstage to the floor. Uh, we were sharing the frequency of, of the local pizza parlor. And uh, we, we get a call from the outside, uh, what's the count from Nassau County? And you would hear, two pepperonis, extra sausage. <laughs> no, no, the count, the count. 1982 seemed a long way off as the governor moved out of the hall. He stopped long enough to talk about the response of the crowd. What produces the joy here is that people feel good about the things that we believe. They feel good about this notion that, hey, look, maybe if we all hang together and work, uh, who knows, it might even make life better. They like that. It's an elemental notion, and it's a beautiful one. In this complicated world, where it's so easy to find things that are distressing, it's nice to have a happy thought that's also plausible, because now we can look back on three and a half years and say, hey, look, we did it. We did make life a little bit better. Not perfect. There's still a lot to do. But maybe if you work together, we can educate people better, make them safer, build housing, fight disease. Why not? Why not live that way? So it's a beautiful thought. It was dressed up by the experts here with laser shows and balloons. They, that laser show is a heck of a... That's an Andrew special, I guarantee that's you. That's Andrew. I'll talk to Andrew about that. The, uh, well, how does it feel when you were waiting to the crowd and people are reaching out for you and trying to touch you? What does that mean to you? If you have any sense at all. You remember Brighton Beach, 1977, when they spat in your face. Same kind of crap. So, you know, that's life. Brighton Beach, they spat on you today. They're not spitting. Maybe next year, who knows? Now we're ready to wrap up this Democratic convention from Albany with three reporters who covered the Capitol for their respective newspapers. First, Lisa Bon Jensen of the Albany Knickerbocker News, Miriam Powell, the Capitol Bureau Chief for Newsday, and Adam Nagorny, the Capitol Bureau Chief for the New York Daily News. We have just witnessed a spectacular show here at the end. I, I'd just like to get your impressions of uh, what we saw just at the end here. Uh, anybody care to start? Lisa? Well, it was some show. If the governor can run his campaign as well, Andy O'Rourke's in big trouble. I think, the camp, I think the show was designed to send people out of here with a lot of energy to get positive stories in newspapers, to get positive stories on TV, and I think it succeeded. It made substance unimportant. Yeah, I agree with Adam. I think that the, what, what they were responding to was the fact that they have a winner, and Cuomo is a proven winner, and partly it's the difference between having an incumbent and not having an incumbent, and part of it is Cuomo's charisma and his oratory, and this was a crowd that was very psyched for this, and it was a very dramatic finish. He, uh, I know that one of his favorite songs uh, is from the inauguration is uh, America by Neil Diamond, but, I mean, was that a... Uh, we're coming to America. Did anybody else read that uh, the way? Are you going to lead your stories that way? I thought it was significant that they used America as opposed to New York, New York. Yeah. It was conspicuously absent. <laughs> yeah, I, really, I view a lot of this whole thing as geared to a national audience. I mean, I think that the whole show that was put on is going to get a lot of attention. There were obviously reporters from across the country. And I looked at the speech as very much, you know, being a national speech. Some of the themes that he was striking as being national themes. The vision, uh, I see. There was a whole sequence of I see, I see the future, that stuff, I see the future. The spirit. And there's one other genetic, part. That, I mean, there was stuff about genetic splicing right. and stuff like that. <laughs> and this whole section, this whole rap that he's taking about how his record doesn't live up to his rhetoric. And I think that's more of a problem nationally than in the state, if you look at the approval ratings in the state. I think that whole, that whole phrase about how we're going to turn the, po we're just telling the New Yorkers how we've turned the poetry of campaign into the brick and mortar of blah, 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 right? But I think that that's a message that is for a national audience. And that's another example of him you know, talking about it. It was for television. I mean, I, I have to say, here's one place where they played to television and that television, the New York City the television was here as well as the local, that any part of the speech can be excerpted in a short clip. There were 20 and 30 second clips. Uh, as a speech, Miriam and I were talking before, we've heard it. It was like retreads of other speeches. And, but when it plays on television with the emotion and the pictures that'll come out of this thing. Plus Cuomo, right? Yeah. Cuomo. Well, that, the point is he's always played to television, David, too. I don't think, I think that's a continuation of something he's been doing for four years. That, They've consistently played the television and, and will continue to the more he becomes a national figure. Right? And I think, in a way, it was good. They, you know, as you know, as a matter of practice, they don't put out speeches before the governor gets them because he has this thing about reporters rustling, whatever his, his hang-up is. But the fact of the matter is you can watch him, and I was recognizing whole sections, as Miriam was saying, from other speeches, but I think that it plays real well on TV, and it just people see it, you know, on the news tonight, and it just looks great. I think one thing Cuomo has to do to, is to get out the message that he has done something in the last three and a half years because people have seen so much in...
Time and Newsweek and other national magazines about what a gifted speaker he is, what a charismatic personality. And at some point, they're going to say, well, what has he done for New York? And I think that's going to be something he's going to hammer away at the campaign. I've done this and this and this. He mentioned the infrastructure bond issue. He mentioned tax cuts. Um, he mentioned increased aid for education. He mentioned the uh, seatbelt law. And he had been criticized about taking credit for the seatbelt law. And he was very funny today. He said, well, um, it wasn't my initiative. It was the legislature's initiative. But when they found out how unpopular it was, they let me take the credit. What are, what are the people that, uh, the drum beaters behind the scenes, the Sandy, Sandy Fruchers and the Andrew Cuomo's, and or what are they trying to make the lead of this event to be? What are they telling you? Contrast. Coronation. Coronation. Well, something I said to Larry Kerwin, is that this, was a, this wasn't a convention, it was a coronation. Oh, no, no. This was a well-thought-out event, you know, and it, we, we discussed matters. I, he was at another convention, apparently. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. And also that whole message, you know, right before we began filming, we began filming this thing, Sandy Fruger came over and said a tale of two conventions. And I, they really want to make the contrast between the chaos and the problems of the Republican convention, which is true, and what happened today. I mean, you can't really deny that that is, and the contrast is pretty striking. The point is that people like Sandy and, and Andrew are concerned about countering the perception that the governor is going to win in a landslide and then not living up to that. I think their concern is that the only way they can lose in this campaign is by not winning by as much as people expect and having the public say, oh, so we won by 55 percent, we thought it was going to be a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. So A, they're trying to do everything, I think, pull out all the stops to get as large a vote as they can, and B, they're trying to lower expectations at, I mean, the, same when, at the same yeah. time. And so that, you expect him to win by 60 percent, right? I do too. <laughs> Let's talk about the second guy on the ticket, uh, Stan Lundin, who uh, uh, didn't exactly electrify the hall uh, with his uh, either uh, interviews that he did off, off the podium or his speech. What's the rationale behind, what's your thoughts, the rationale behind picking Stan Lundin as uh, as your running mate, from Cuomo's perspective? There's two. The first one is that he wins a lot of support in that district. In a Republican district, he was the first Democrat elected there, what, 100 years? And it's a huge district. It's a huge district, and he wins real well. And the second one is, at least his picture, he appears okay. He kind of has a gubernatorial aura about him. I think that's all that mattered. I'll point out that Lundy did not agree with Cuomo on a bunch of issues, including Graham Rudman, the tax cut. He voted in one case for the death penalty in Congress for traitors. I think it was purely a political calculation. And every one other factor, political everything calculation that, and national political calculation to get him as much. See, well, to me, the strategy is to see whether us, he travels. I mean, does does Lundin end up being the guy who goes to midwestern states to talk about the Great Lakes Treaty or whatever other state business happens to come up in the Midwest? Because you know, helps Cuomo win by as large a margin as possible. Well, and he doesn't well I think somebody up. you could have found other people. Somebody, a Tom Downey from Long Island could have arguably brought out a larger vote because there's a much larger vote on Long Island than in Jamestown, you know. But, but again, the other thing is, I think, the contrast. You don't want competition. The last thing this ticket needs is someone else who's charismatic or who's a good orator. You don't need that. I mean, what we saw here tonight shows that they have all of the electrifying force that they need. What they need is somebody who's solid and a good number two Safe. guy. And yeah. I watched Lundin go around a couple nights ago to different delegations in the Hilton. And he was introducing himself. And what he kept saying is, I'm a team player. That's what he, you know, that was his refrain. And I think that's exactly what they want. Well, I think uh, Lundin's reputation in Congress is one of a hard-working guy, but one who doesn't make waves. And that was the assessment of uh, Congressman Sam Stratton who was the head of the New York delegation. And he said, you know, I think the governor chose him because he's not going to overshadow him. Well, Dean uh, has been in the Congress for uh, about 10 years. He gives up a safe seat, even though it's in Republican territory. What's the calculation he makes? Uh, even in two years, even if Cuomo doesn't, I, I only have to wait four years, Cuomo might not come around for a third term, even if he doesn't go for the presidency. I mean, is that basically it? It's a good shot for me to take at this well, point? Maybe he wants to run for Senate at some point. I mean, maybe it's, it's certainly, for a guy who's been in Congress 10 years and nobody outside of Western New York's ever heard of the guy, at least he's going to get a lot of his ability. There was this great image as the Cuomo entourage swept out of the hall, and somebody who knew Lundin, apparently, was right around here at the stairs. And Lundin, his eyes were wild, you know, and, and they grabbed hands for a minute, and then the guy was swept, Lundin was swept away in the crowd. And that, I mean, he's gotten on a whirlwind here. I mean, he's, he's been taken away from whatever mundane things he was doing in Congress to join this bandwagon that's oh, yeah. rolling. Yesterday, we were all fighting to get interviews with Lundin. 
and he was just awed by it. He said, this has never happened to me before. Usually I'm seeking interviews. I mean, I'm seeking the press. I thought it was interesting. One of my favorite lines about Lundin comes from Assemblyman Dan Walsh. Um, and he noted that Lundin was Swedish, and there's not a big Swedish vote in New York. But uh, Walsh said, well, Stanley is very Swedish, and that will help the governor a lot in Minnesota. So I think everybody is looking at Lundin as the guy who might fill in in case Cuomo runs for president. Now we're going to talk about the Senate race between John Dyson and Mark Green. Uh, that's the only controversy, the only real story here this week. The closet Republican, as Green is calling Dyson, versus uh, the left winger, you know, that uh, Dyson is uh, calling Green. What What do you think? The popular wisdom always is that the uh, the liberal wins the Democratic primary. You subscribe to that, Lisa? Well, the liberal would be Mark Green, but one problem with that is that John Dyson was the one who got the liberal party line. So it's going to be a little confusing in voters' minds who is the liberal and who's the conservative. I mean, Mark Green can talk about John Dyson as a closet conservative, but then he's got to explain why Dyson's name is going to be on the liberal line in November, regardless of who wins the primary. So I think primary voters, I really agree. I think primary voters are a little more attuned, and I think that's what's Dyson's potential problem here. I mean, the primary voters do tend to know who the candidates are, and I think they do tend to vote more liberal Democrat. But you've got to weigh that off against the fact that Dyson's going to spend millions of dollars, and he can reshape his image. I don't think his image is that strong. Also, don't you have to... Uh, Mark Green may have a tendency to shoot himself in the foot. He already did. I guess he gave an interview in New York on Sunday where he talked about uh, the governor's monkeys, and I'd rather hear from the organ grinder. And, I mean, that's a... Uh, that really ingratiated himself with the Cuomo yeah, people. They were yeah, just, yeah. just delighted. And it caused some problems on the floor with delegates, oh, right? Yeah, people I were think, very uh, upset. I surprised he got as many percent as he got. And I think, to tell you the truth, I think Dyson has a, has a much better shot than, than Green does against Damato. I thought Dyson really I'm laid out sure a campaign. I'm not sure that that's... I think that, that, that if Green won the primary, he'd come off as a giant killer and be in a much stronger Ooh. position at that point. Um, I, I think it comes down, I agree with Adam that voters are fairly sophisticated in primaries. You get a hardcore Democratic vote. That should help Mark. But what people with the Liberal Party is saying and what voters may say is we think Dyson has more credibility and he's a better shot to beat D'Amato. And that's sort of whether that outweighs Green's Liberal credentials, Dyson which I think, you know. has a real sense of the jugular, which I thought he showed during the speech when he started talking about the PAC money from Houston and all these allusions to, you know, D'Amato's integrity. Well, you know, they're yeah. both, they're both very glib. They talk in they sound bites, especially right. Green yeah. talks in 30-second sound bites, but they both could have a tendency, Green did it already, and you were saying before yeah, that Dyson Dyson's might shoot himself. Dyson's done a lot of wacky things in his time, too, so. So um, it's going to be, that'll be an interesting, it'll be an interesting summer. We're all going to get back into the uh, the pros of governing. Uh, Kenny Shapiro told me today, I met him in the hallway here, and he said there's no law that says that we all have to get out of here by July 4th, which is usually the deadline. So you feel want to hear, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is a law, and that is that I'm going on vacation in the so middle of July, okay. and so is Miriam, not together, and that's all that counts, oh. <laughs> not together. We're going to send you back to work now over to the Capitol, uh, <laughs> and you can take your vacation later on. Uh, this has been Dave Hepp from the uh, Albany Convention Center covering the Democrats. We'll see you next week on Inside Albany. Inside Albany is made possible by the public television stations of New York and the New York Network. Additional support provided by the Energy Association of New York State. Made up of New York State's seven investor-owned electric companies. Providing energy and jobs for a growing New York.